You know, some people don't realize that you can actually have fun at church. I was in a church recently uh, that I didn't feel comfortable because nobody around me felt comfortable. It was all stiff and uh, formal. No, no, I'm not against formality, but when you come into the presence of God, it's okay to be happy. It's okay to rejoice. It's okay to sense the presence of God in your life. Well, we're in this series in Colossians, and we've been talking about who we are in Jesus Christ. What is our identity? You're not who your past says you are. You're not who the world says you are. You're not even who your failures or your accomplishments say you are. You are who Jesus says you are. And so we've been going through the book of Colossians, and today I want to talk to you on this subject, overcoming guilt-driven Christianity. Now, I'm going to explain that. What is guilt-driven Christianity? But I want to give you a statement that I want you to chew on. It's a tweetable thing if you do the Twitter thing, okay? Uh, and, and here it is. Most Christians have just enough Christianity to make them miserable. You say, what in the world does that mean? Well, we're talking about the kind of Christian faith. I'm not saying these people aren't born again. I'm not saying these people aren't uh, followers of Christ. I just believe that they haven't discovered the grace of God. They haven't learned about the grace of God and they are being driven by their guilt rather than by the grace of God that he so richly pours out in our life. And let me just kind of uh, drill down on that a little bit so you understand what I'm talking about. When we're talking about guilt-driven Christianity, I'm not one of these people that like, you know, throws uh, the value of guilt out the door completely. You say, what are you talking about? Well, guilt is valuable for the guilty, okay? If you're guilty, guilt is a valuable thing, okay? It'll help you. But when you're no longer guilty, when you have been forgiven, when you have been redeemed by the grace of God, when you are a part of the family of God, when he looks at you and does not see your past, he does not see your sin, he does not see your unrighteousness, but he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ, it is wrong to be driven by guilt because you are no longer guilty. Now here's the problem. In our mind, that's a hard transition to make. Do you know what I'm talking about? I mean, have you ever gone to church because your mama said to do it? Now, I know as a kid you did, right? Um, you know, as a kid, maybe you like going to church as a kid, but maybe your mom and dad forced you to go. And I'm not against forcing your kids to go, okay? Uh, I'm not a part of this parenting idea that lets them make up their own mind. I realize they have to have their own relationship with God. You cannot, it's like the old saying, you can take a horse to water, but you can't force them to drink. But you don't have that same thought with school. You make them go to school. He said, well, they need to learn. They need to learn about Jesus too. I realize that you cannot force a kid into a relationship with God, but chances are they're gonna have a whole lot better chance of coming into a right relationship with God when they're in church than if they're not. But guilt-driven Christianity, what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about this kind of Christianity that misunderstands the grace of God. I told you that uh, most Christians have just enough Christianity to make them miserable. And what I mean by that is that they think that cr the Christian life is nothing but rules. And I agree. If the Christian life was all don't, don't do this, and don't do that, and don't do the other. If that's all there was to Christianity, that would be kind of miserable because you know, you remember the old hymn, I was sinking deep in sin, you know. Well, when I was in college, we went to a, uh, uh, I went to a Christian college, and uh, we would kind of sing, I was sinking deep in sin, having a wonderful time, right, you know. 
Um, but the truth of the matter is, when we are driven by our guilt rather than the grace of God, it changes everything. We see the Christian life as nothing more than a bunch of don'ts. I think there's three questions you kind of ask yourself to assess whether you are living in the joy. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not suggesting that the Christian life is uh, license. No, there's liberty in Christ, but that does not give you the license to sin because you know, if that's what you think that means, then you're misunderstanding because God has a life for you that is filled with joy. Jesus said, I came to give life and give it to the fullest. He said, abundant life. And I, and I realize that you can hear some people talk about that and misunderstand it, okay? But I want you to understand that in your relationship with God, there should be unspeakable indescribable joy. Now, I'm not saying that that's the way life always is 100% of the time. The Bible says, give thanks in everything, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. But it doesn't mean that everything in life is going to be enjoyable. It doesn't mean that everything, the Bible says in Romans that all things work together for good for those who love God. It doesn't say that all things are good. But God does have a plan. God does have something for you that's better than what you would have without him. And therein lies the joy. So maybe a couple questions you ask yourself about this kind of Christian living. And I think one question is, do you live by rules or relationship? Now we hear that a lot, right? But what is your relationship with Jesus Christ like? Is it a dynamic relationship that you love God? Or is it this terrifying idea that God is the colossal killjoy in the sky, and the moment you get close or in the vicinity of having fun, he's going to strike you with lightning? Well, that, that is a wrong view of God, okay? Our God is a generous God. He's a loving heavenly Father. He has more love for us than we can even comprehend. So what kind of relationship? Are you driven just simply by rules? Now, I don't know about you, but I'm one of these people that likes to check things off of a list. Does anybody like working that way? When I check things off a list, I feel a sense of accomplishment. And I'll often have a list of things to do on my day. And boy, I just like, I love checking that off. It gives me a sense of pleasure. I don't know why. But are you that way with God? Is it just simply a checklist? Look, if you had a marriage that all it was was a checklist, I need to say I love you today to my wife. I need to be kind today to my wife. Well, that's not a, that's not a dynamic love relationship, is it? So, do you live by rules or relationships? Here's another question. Do you have religion or an abundant life? I'm going to tell you, when you get that abundant life in Jesus Christ, you don't have to have religion. Now, is Christianity a religion? Yes, but it's more about a relationship with God. And when you get that, when you discover that, nobody can keep you from being in that relationship with God. You know how valuable it is. And then the third question I think we ask ourselves is this. Do I live by tradition or transformation? In other words, am I living by man's tradition? And let, let me just give you an illustration. And I've talked about this before. Uh, my dad was lost as he, he says, I was lost as a goose in a hailstorm. Um, my dad was far from God, and he got saved, and we began to go to church as a family, and um, it began to transform us. But the church I went to, started going there, I was about 10 years old. It was, it was a good church. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm very thankful for what God did in my life at that place. But it was one of those churches that was very legalistic, he said, what is legalistic? I'm going to talk about that next week so you don't want to miss that message. But it was this approach to Christianity that was completely about what 
was proper in the past or this list of rules. Let, let me just kind of read to you some of the things. They identified Christians by what they looked like and where they went rather than who they knew. Let me explain that. Um, they had a Christian school. I went to that Christian school, started going there when I was in fifth grade. And um, there were all these rules. And I'm not against having rules, especially for school children, okay? You got to have rules. I understand this. But these rules were transposed as if somehow this made you spiritual. Um, as for the boys, you couldn't have long hair. And by long, it couldn't be touching your ears or your collar. Now, if you were bald and did the comb over, you can have six feet of hair and comb it back and forth. That was okay, but it couldn't touch the ears or the collar. I have no idea where they got that, but that was spiritual. If you had long hair, that was unspiritual. If you had short hair, Tom as a guy, that was spiritual. Here's another rule they had. Women, girls, could not wear pants. Now, once again, I have no idea. Well, I do kind of know where it came from, but it's, it's a dumb, dumb rule. But they, they took it from just being a rule for their school and made it that if you were spiritual as a woman, if you really loved Jesus, you wouldn't wear those pants. In fact, I heard preachers call them, and he was referring to tight pants on women. He talked about women wearing bullfighting britches. <laughs> That's one of the funniest things I've ever heard. It's like, you ladies don't wear them bullfighting britches. <laughs> now, and it went on. I mean, you couldn't go to the skating rink. You couldn't go to the movie theater. Uh, and there was all kinds of rules, okay? And literally, now I'm not making this up, in this Christian school, and in the church, there were people that got Christian character awards. And I put that in air quotes because these were people that looked right according to their tradition. They acted right. They didn't go to the wrong places according to them. And they were held up as good Christians. And you know what? They weren't even saved. Now, here's the point. If you live by guilt-driven Christianity rather than the grace of God, you are in danger of producing that kind of Christianity. And let me tell you, that kind of Christianity drives people from the faith. When people discover that you've got a relationship with God, and when you have joy, and, and when you really you don't have it all figured out. You're not perfect. You don't claim to be perfect. You're not judgmental, but you love God, then it makes all the difference in the world. Well, the Apostle Paul wrote about this, and I'm going to read to you today in Colossians chapter 2, and we'll read verses 6 through 15. So he says, therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Now, let's pause for a second. How do you receive Jesus? By faith. How do you receive Jesus? By not saying it's according to my works. It's not how good I am. I'm not going to work my way to heaven. I'm not going to earn it. Do you know that most people in the world say that the way you get to heaven when you die is what? By being a good person. Keeping the Ten Commandments. You ask the vast majority of people in this country, how do you go to heaven? And they'll tell you you do it by being good. Well, that's not the way you get saved. The Bible is very clear. You can't be good enough. We fall short. We have sin. And so how do you come to Jesus Christ? By grace, by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. So when you come to him, you admit, I need forgiveness. I need your help. I need you, God. And he said, as you came to Christ, so walk in him. In other words, your walk means your Christian life, okay? So he said, in the same way that you got saved, that's the same way that you become sanctified. In other words, you become more like Christ. That's the same way that you grow spiritually. That's the same way that you please God. It is through faith, but not just faith, admitting to God that you can't do it by yourself, that you need his help that you're not going to try to do this all alone. Doesn't mean you don't 
try, doesn't mean that you don't put forth effort, doesn't mean that you don't have discipline, but it means that you trust solely and completely in God. So he said, in that way, walk in him. He said, when that happens, you'll be rooted and built up in him and established in the faith. We want to be established in our faith. Just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Isn't it amazing that when you begin to live this way, you'll become more thankful? You ever have a bad attitude? You ever stop counting your blessings? You ever fail to see the good in the things that happen around you? We're all guilty of that. But he said, the more you realize that you must rest in him, you must trust in him, the more thankful you'll be. He said, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. I'll come back and explain that in a minute. For in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And that just simply means he was 100% God in the flesh. He became a real human and he was fully God, but he was fully man. And you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In other words, he's in charge of everything. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. Now, to be honest, that's one of these weird things that we talk about in Scripture, and I'm going to explain what that means in a minute. He says, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith and the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead, and you who were dead in your trespasses, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. And I hope you'll take time to think about that statement right there. God canceled your debt. What was the debt that you owed? It was your sin debt. It was that God would be right in bringing judgment on you because of sin. And make no mistake, we're all guilty. Now, there are some Billy Grahams in the world and there are some other Teresas in the world, but even those two people famously admitted that they were not perfect and they needed God's forgiveness and God's righteousness. Why? Because all of us sin, that's why. Every one of us. And Jesus canceled the debt. In other words, he paid it for us on the cross. Once again, this whole thing is showing us how to live, how to concentrate on what is important, not rules, but rather in our faith and our relationship with him. Uh, by counseling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross, and he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. I, I don't know about you, but if you understand that last sentence, it simply means this, that he defeated the devil and all of his minions and all of his demons and everything that they can bring against you. He defeated them. So if you've ever done something you shouldn't do and you say, well, the devil made me do it, not if you're a Christian. Seriously, God sent Jesus to defeat them. Now, I know you got some notes here. Let me just encourage you to write down these four things. Just fill in the blank. It won't be long. Uh, the Bible tells us that living by faith in God's grace does four things. Number one, it strengthens your foundation for living. He said, therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. He says that you will have a foundation for living. Do we not live in a day that we need foundation? I mean, what around us seems like it's got solid foundation? I mean, my goodness, we even... Uh, struggle in this society defining 
uh, the sexes. We, def- we struggle defining right and wrong. We, just, we struggle with all these things, and it's crazy. But there is something that you can rely on. There is something you can trust. He says that foundation is in Jesus Christ. Jeremiah 17, 8 says, they are like trees, talking about the righteous. They're like trees planted along a riverbank with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat. Boy, isn't that a good way to live. I'm not bothered by the heat. I'm not bothered by the drought. I'm not bothered by the storm going on around me. Why? I've got roots. I'm down by the stream. I'm down by the rivers of water. He says that uh, they're not worried by heat or the long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. That's a beautiful thing that God says about those that live like Paul said, the same way that you came to Christ in salvation is the same way you're to walk. You're not to live by this guilt-driven Christianity, but rather by the loving grace of God. When that happens, you're going to have foundation in your life. Here's the second thing he said. It transforms the way you think. Man, don't we need some transformation in our thinking today? Uh, Look at what he said. Let me just read it again. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. Now, let me ask a question. Is there anything wrong with philosophy, especially Christian philosophy? Well, no. He's not saying that you shouldn't read or study or get an education. What he's saying is, notice, philosophy and empty deceit. You know what the philosophy of the world is? You go to heaven by being good. He says, reject that. That's deceitful. That's not how you get right with God. Empty deceit. The fact is the devil will try everything in his power to convince you that the Christian life is a trade down, not a trade up. And as a young man, I used to think maybe that was true. Because I was driven, I was surrounded by this rules-driven Christianity This idea that the only way you could possibly please God is don't smoke, dip, or chew, or run with girls that do, you know. I mean, that was was our philosophy, okay. And quite frankly, it didn't drive me closer to God. It drove me further away from God. Because the more that was thrust down my throat without understanding a relationship with God, the more I wanted to do that stuff. (laughs) It's crazy, isn't it? No, once again, uh, please don't hear what God is not saying. He's not saying you have license to go out and sin. That's not what he's saying. But all these traditions and all these things that get built up and heaped up, and Jesus talked about the Pharisees doing this, just heaping up all these burdens and not lifting one finger to help them overcome those burdens. That's what religion is like without a relationship with God. Because it's burdensome and it's heavy. And like I said in the very beginning, many Christians have just enough Christianity to make them miserable. They think that it's all about what they can't do and they never realize what they can do in Christ. So uh, he says, don't be deceived by human tradition according to the elemental spirits of the world. That's talking about demonic activity. Make no mistake, the devil and his demons, they want you to be defeated. They want you to sin. They want you to fail. They do not want you to pray. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, Jesus himself said that the devil himself came to steal, to kill, and destroy. He said, but I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And so that is from the mouth of Jesus himself. So he's saying, don't be deceived by that. Uh, 1 Timothy 6, 20, guard the good news which has been entrusted to you. Turn away from pointless discussions and the claims of false knowledge that people use to oppose the Christian faith. I'm one of these people that really enjoys watching these debates between an atheist and a Christian, someone that knows what they're talking about. Uh, I love that. I love watching this stuff about science. 
Uh, Dr. John Lennox, uh, an Oxford professor, is a very, very strong Christian and is a mathematician and a scientist and a theologian. He is one of the most brilliant men I've ever seen. I, I watched uh, a debate he was having recently. Have you ever been told or have you ever heard people say, well, science and religion can't really mix. They can't coexist together. That is the biggest load of nonsense in the history of the world. In fact, science began in Christianity. It was the discovery to please God. That's what it was about. And it's true that religion and, and science don't mix if you have an atheistic approach to science, the idea that no matter what the evidence is that there is a God, no matter what the evidence is that supports your belief in God, this idea that, well, we've just got to have that worldview and reject that, well, that's nonsense, okay? And, and some of the leading thinkers of the world are discovering that. And even atheistic scientists are admitting that their worldview has a major flaw in it. Why is that? Well, because that is what Paul talked about there, that nonsense that silly arguments. Don't get sucked in by that. We have some young people in our church that have uh, recently graduated, getting ready to start into college. I would challenge you, stay strong in your relationship with God. You see, there are gonna be people that try to convince you, and a lot of them are smart sounding, but the Bible says that people that reject God professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And so reject that uh, because it'll transform the way you think when you live the way God wants us to live. Here's the third thing. It connects you to God's promises. Verses 11 through 14. Um, he talked about that, and I won't reread it, but he talked about spiritual circumcision. Now, I know that's a, a thing that in our culture we're like, What? What in the world is that? Well, what he was talking about there is that God is a covenant God, and to the Israelite people, circumcision was what set them apart and identified them as the people of God. It identified them as in a relationship with the God who keeps covenant. In other words, the God who keeps his promises. And when Paul talks about this, he's simply talking about the fact that you've been saved. That when you come into a relationship with God, God is a covenant-keeping God. God is a promise-keeping God. He will not lie. He will always keep his promises. And what he was saying there is this. When you understand this, that what God does in you when you get saved is he cuts away that relationship with the old flesh, that old nature. Not that you still, you still have an old nature, even though you're a Christian now, uh, because you're still human, you'll still sin, you'll still fall short, but he's put within you a new nature, and what God wants to do in you is to transform you and to have you live by the promises of God. You see, the, the practical side of this point is that you can live with God's promises even when life doesn't always go perfectly. Let, let, let me just give you a warning. Your life is not going to be without problems. That's called life. Your life is not going to be perfect. Everything you desire, everything you wish for is not going to come true. And, and the way that we get through that, there's really a couple ways. Try to do it on your own and you live in depression. Maybe you even get so depressed that you think about ending your life because there's no hope. So you can either live without hope or you can live with hope. And here's what I know. When I begin to live by the promises of God, when I begin to believe the promises of God, no matter what happens, I have hope. And I know that God is in control. If I get a bad health diagnosis, I still have hope. You say, what is my hope? Well, that God will heal, yes. But even if he does not, and I tell people that God heals every Christian completely. 
You say, wait a minute, I know people that are Christians that didn't get healed. Let me explain. God either heals you, uh, sometimes he uses medicine, okay? Sometimes he uses your body. Your body can naturally heal itself. And sometimes he heals supernaturally, okay? And I've seen this many, many times in my ministry and in this church. People that have had cancer, God healed them. People, I mean, we can just go down the line, okay? So does God heal supernaturally? Absolutely. But is it true that God heals every Christian physically here in this world 100% of the time? No, it is not. You said, what do you mean then? You, you misspoke earlier when you said God heals Christians 100% of the time. The fourth way that he heals is he heals permanently. You see, when he takes you to heaven, you're not ever going to be sick again. You're not ever going to have pain again. You're not ever going to have cancer again. You're not ever going to have heart disease again. You're not ever going to have any pain again. You see, when he takes us home, he heals us permanently. You say, well, you know, that doesn't sound very satisfying. To be honest, it's not satisfying to those of us who are left behind but it's very satisfying to the person that goes to heaven. I can promise you, anyone that dies and goes to heaven to be with God and they're healed and they have no more pain, no more sorrow, no, no more depression, no more regret, I promise you they don't want to come back to this earth. Now, for us that are behind, left behind, yeah, it brings sorrow. But my point is this. God is the one that will keep his promises to you. Don't miss it. And then here's the final thing. Living this kind of life guarantees victory in spiritual warfare. You say, what are you talking about? Well, he said there that he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Ephesians 6, 11 and 12 says, put on the whole armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. Did you know the devil has strategies? He's going to try to trick you. He's going to try to deceive you. Don't you be deceived by his strategies. Put on the armor of God, he says, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. Look, some people think that our enemy is the opposing political party. That's not your enemy. Now, they might be dumb, okay, in your opinion. But that's not your enemy. You know who your enemy is? It's the devil. It's his strategy. That's your enemy. He says, uh, put on the whole armor of God, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Here's what Jesus said, and I want you to get this, and don't miss it. it Paul wrote here, he said, look, Jesus triumphed over them. What does that mean? We'll go all the way back to the very beginning in the book of Genesis. You remember the story about Adam and Eve and how God created everything? And do you remember how the, the devil was uh, there and he tempted Eve and she sinned? He deceived her. He lied to her. And do you remember that God came out and he says, Adam, where are you? And not that God needed to know where he was. He did know where Adam was. God wanted Adam to know where he was. And of course, when God killed an animal to take coats of skin, it represented the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But do you remember what he said to the devil, the serpent? And don't be deceived by that. Uh, that's talking about the devil there, okay? Do you know what he said to him? Do you remember? He said, I will put enmity between you and the woman. Between your seed, who is the seed of the devil, who is the offspring of the devil. Jesus said, it's the people that are of the devil that don't know Jesus Christ. And he said, between the seed of the woman. Well, you know, I'm no scientist, but I do remember from eighth grade science that 
the seed does not come from the woman. The egg comes from the woman, and the seed comes from the man. What is the seed of the woman? That was referring to the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Because he was fully human, but he was not of man. He was of God. And then I love what he said to him. He said, and you're going to bruise his heel. <laughs> but he's going to crush your head. Now, you can get a heel bruise, and it is not fatal. But have you ever stomped an old snake? You ever cut an old snake's head off? I grew up on a farm in the country in North Carolina. I've done it many a time. I know what it's like to crush the head of a snake. I know what it's like to kill that snake. And what Jesus said was this, I am going to have victory because I am going to defeat him. I'm not just going to have victory over him. I'm going to crush his head. And ladies and gentlemen, you can have God's promise on your side. When you live by the grace of God and by faith in him, not in your strength, not in your power, but in his, here's what he says. You don't have to worry about winning against the devil because I have already won. I've already won. You can just come on in and be on my team. I love that. I love that. And that's what God has promised for you. I hope today that you will not live by guilt-driven Christianity. Live in the grace of God. Understand, you say, well, I don't deserve it. Duh. <laughs> That's why it's called grace. If you earn a paycheck, does your boss give you your paycheck and say, well, this is the grace of our company. Give no, you earn that. You're like, hey, Buster, you give me that because I earned that. That's mine. You try to keep that and see what happens, all right? Well, that's not grace. But when you understand the grace of God, that it's poured out, that it's unearned, it's undeserved, it's unmerited. It's not because of what you did or didn't do. It's because of him. When you begin to tap into that, it transforms everything in your life. Before I pray today, maybe you're watching online or maybe you're in the room today and you'd like to know more about this relationship with Jesus Christ, this relationship with God. Well, I assure you, it doesn't come by being a member of a church. It doesn't come even by going to church, though you should go to church. It doesn't come by being good. It comes through the grace of and the mercy of God. And so you say, well, how do I get that? Well, you don't earn it, but you do receive it. The Bible tells us that salvation is a gift of God. Now, the last time I checked, you don't call an earned paycheck a gift. That's earned. That's not a gift. But when you get a gift, what do you do? What do you do? Do you earn it? No. Do you pay for it? No. What do you do for a gift? You receive it. You just receive it. That's how you get a gift. You receive it. And what God has promised to you is that he will give you the gift of salvation if you will receive it. You say, how do I do that? Well, it's an act of faith. It's an act of admitting that you cannot do this on your own. It's an act of admitting that you need help. You need God's help. And so pray something like this, in the room or online, dear Jesus, thank you for the gift of salvation. I pray that you'd forgive me. I pray that you'd come into my life, be the leader of my life, the Lord of my life, and transform me. And God promises if you'll pray that prayer, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so today, if you prayed that prayer to receive Christ, online, click at the bottom, let us know so that we can follow up with you. Or if you're in the room and you did that today, take the next step card, put your name on there, your contact information, and check that you prayed to receive Christ today. I would ask this question for those of you that are already saved. What did God speak to you about today? What did the Holy Spirit say to you? Maybe he convicted you about 
guilt-driven Christianity. Maybe God spoke to you about allowing him to transform you. Once again, you gotta have the relationship. You gotta have the relationship. And when you begin to understand that, it changes everything in your life. And so I hope today that you'll pray about that. We have a prayer team that'll be available at our uh, prayer team area over here after the service. If you'd like to pray with one of them, they'll be glad to pray with you at the end of the service. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help us to see the beauty and the majesty of the Christian life. Help us to see how glorious Christianity really is. Help us to see that it's not about a bunch of rules. It's not about holier than thou. It's not about throwing rocks. But it's about a loving God, a Savior that sacrificed for us. It is about your redemption, your forgiveness. It is about your love for us. And God, I pray that you help us to live in that. And by doing that, we'll transform the world around us. And I know that you'll be glorified. And we praise you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, let me just give you a couple instructions. One, if uh, today's your first time or you're new and you've never filled out one of the Next Step cards, do it today. Drop it in the box on the way out. There's this drop box on the way out over here. You'll see it. It's a little black box made out of metal, and it's got a slot that you can drop it in. You can drop that in or an offering if you missed it uh, or a Next Step card. Take your next step. We'll have a, a Next Step class coming up. Uh, you can get involved in small groups when they start back again in August. Uh, you can get involved in a ministry. There are many ways you can get involved. So I hope you will take your next step here at our church. Okay, are we good? Do we have fun today? Invite somebody to be with you next week. God bless you. I love you.